Hello and welcome to the Quality of Mind Transforming Business podcast series. And today's episode is actually taken from a conversation that I had with Mark McCartney, who is running a wonderful project where he's going around the world asking people, what is a good life? And Mark was able to ask me some really excellent questions all about quality of mind. And this episode actually will be great for people who are brand new to quality of mind because it will give you a bit of an intro and also for the raw regular listeners, give you some more depth on your insights about some of the nuances of quality of mind. So as usual, have fun being curious and catch you next time. Pierce, thank you very, very much for joining me here on the What is a Good Life uh, podcast today. Um, Since I've become aware of your work in the last few weeks, I've been very much looking forward to this conversation. Well, Mark, thanks for having me. Um, I'm intrigued. I, I love the, the sort of topic and the direction of what you're doing. So um, pleasure to be involved. So thanks for um, having me on. Cheers, Pierce. Um, so Pierce, as I, as I kick these conversations off with, it's with the question of, is there a question you're trying to answer as you move through life? I, I guess there kind of is. And uh, for me, I'm lucky enough to sort of combine my general interests and passion in life with my work. So whether it's for me or whether it's for my clients is what's the sort of most, I guess, powerful thing you can explore, talk about, realize that will produce a little bit like the title of your, your podcast, the, the most wonderful, enjoyable, peaceful um, life that, that brings you what you want, fulfillment and joy. So it's o- over my career of being, you know, personal professional development coach, trainer, facilitator all those things that's evolved for me over the last 25 years as to what to point people at including myself to have the the most wonderful life um and i don't necessarily mean on the outside but also on the inside so that that is something that fascinates me that's that's what drives my my work my my own evolution and that with my clients because what i do with my clients just follows what what's going on for me um and i keep finding the most wonderful things that are available for us as human beings that I never would have thought of 30, 40 years ago. So that, that's what drives me. Could you uh, elaborate on some of these wonderful things that you're, you're discovering? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the nutshell of my evolution, I guess. And I've, I've got other podcasts which go for this in more detail. But I, I guess since, since a kid, I've always been fascinated by people human beings. I mean, I've, my, my dad runs a family business and he used to always come back and talk about the business, but really he was talking about the people in the business. It wasn't really the factory that made the widgets. It was the people bit. Um, my, my mum was a farmer. Yes, yeah, she'd talk about the crops and the animals, but she'd also talk about the people and the neighboring farmers. So people, people, people is all from a little kid. I've just been fascinated by what it is to be a person and how we all get on. Um, and how we can change and how we can go from being in a good mood to a bad mood and how certain things happen for some people and don't happen for other people. So, I mean, I had a, a you know, a sort of a schooling, which was academic, of course, you know, I then sort of read law at university. And again, the thing I was fascinated with was, wasn't the statutes. It was the sociology of law. It was, well, how come that judge made that decision? Uh, and I went into business. I went into, uh, I worked for FMCG, fast moving consumer goods, big businesses um, like Walkers, uh, Crisps and Mars Confectionery. Again, the thing I was interested in with the people. And then I came across, uh, well, I I studied a bit of counseling very early on. um, And I realized it wasn't really for me because it went, I thought I would like it because it went into people, but it went too past and I wasn't interested. And then in, in sort of late 90s, 99, I came across two things at about the same time. One was coaching but not sports coaching, but person coaching, life coaching, and something called neuro-linguistic programming, uh, NLP, um, people like uh, Richard Bandler and Anthony Robbins, those kind of guys. And I was like, wow, this is phenomenal because it answers a lot of the questions I have about human performance and human well-being. Um, And actually coaching gave me the framework to do it. And I sort of said to myself, I I want to quit my job and do this. I I, want to be one of these coaches. And back then, you know, 2000s, there wasn't a lot of people doing it. I mean, I I set myself a little website out and I was on page one Google. I mean, Google was early back then too. (laughs) But, you know, there I was, bang. Um, Feelhappynow.co.uk was my first coaching thing. And I found by having conversations in a particular way with people, by having asking particular questions, by helping them see the role of their mind, 
you could really make a difference. And I said to myself, you know, you know, does it feel right to charge someone for having a conversation was part of my thinking. And then I realized, well, if it produces value for them, yes, because people are doing all sorts of things to have a better life. They'll, they'll buy profiteroles or go on holiday or buy new shoes or get a promotion and here they are, can have a conversation and feel better. So, um, and it went from there really. And then my evolution has been moving away from those, what I would call psychological sort of interventions um, where I'm helping people have a different take on their psychology or reprogramming their psychology, which things like neurolinguistic programming were doing, positive psychology. I also did things like hypnotherapy, um, EFT, tapping, energy work. So I've been through quite a few things. And then uh, at about 2008, 2009, I, I was lucky enough to be pointed in a slightly different way. Um, which was to look at well, what we were before psychology, what I call before psychology. Some people might want to call it spiritual. I, I tend to call it before psychology because that scares the horses less, um, especially when you work <laughs> in business. Uh, and really it's looking at, you know, the nature of thought rather than the content of thought, the nature of thought. And then that sort of went a bit further up into the nature of consciousness. So even before, so I had a phase where I was talking a lot about the nature of thought. Uh, and then I now sort of in the last six, seven years moved to more looking at the nature of consciousness and awareness and what we are and the whole very fabric of what reality is made of. So then it starts to dovetail with science, what science is starting to find now or what science is finding it can't find, which is probably more accurate way of saying it, as in it can't find any basis for the current scientific paradigm of materialism and physicalism. It, it just can't find how that works, <laughs> although it's been spouting it for a hundred years. Um, so you start to see that science and spirituality are coming to the same point. They're coming to say, okay, maybe the world of matter is not primary. Maybe what we aren't, cause you know, we're all told we're brain centric, you know, everything comes from the brain, from the brain. I, I'm a, I'm an entity. I'm a body mind walking around. I'm Piers, you're Mark. And we see the world out there. There's duality. Science can't really support that anymore. More importantly than science not being able to support it, direct experience for you or I in any moment, and by you and I, I mean any of the six billion on this planet, can't support that either. Because from direct experience, it doesn't take long for you to have a look going, okay, I, I can't find matter being fundamental. All I can find is the mind, you know, and I, yeah. so, and I can't find a separate me either. So direct experience and science are starting to point to the fact that maybe materialism is is an old paradigm, just like when we realized the planet kind of was round and not flat. And when we realized, oh, we go around the sun, not the other way around, <laughs> we, we, I think we're getting there. And then you could go, well, so what, what's that got to do with having a great life? You could go, well, surely that's a scientific or a philosophical or a religious matter. But actually the bit I love about my job is connecting that with being better at business, being a better parent, enjoying life more. So going back to your question, what's a good life? To me, you have to start right at the beginning and ask yourself the question, what are we? Whereas in the old days, possibly I would answer the what is a good life question by going, let's sort your psychology out. Yeah. And that might sort your, your, your game of life out. Now I'm going back before that and answering the question by starting somewhere quite different. That's a potted history. You might want to dive into more of that yeah might, well look i don't know so you, you go from there mark on, on yeah what? yeah so first of all i i love this uh even just the sentiment of before psychology i don't know if it feels like a very free and open place or you, you know what i mean like where there's lots uh there's lots of directions that a human can go from that perspective um just intrigued what what led you or what was the jumping off point for you in terms of, okay, look, I'm doing this NLP stuff. I'm looking at things from a psychology point of view. What was the, the point that you kind of, I don't know, that you ran out of road with that investigation? Yeah. Um, it was really a, 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 someone I'd been done a lot of training and, and a, a mentoring with a guy called Michael Neal, um, who was a big NLPer. He kind of showed me there was something else. Now I took a lot of convincing because remember I'd had 10 years of doing it the other way. Yeah. So they're always the hardest converts, right? Someone, someone who's, who's put their, their kind of identity and their trade in a particular way. And then to go, well, that's kind of backwards. So 
intellectually, I heard what was going on and I thought, oh, yeah, no, I think I'm okay with what I'm doing. And it wasn't until the sort of penny dropped, realized when I saw it, saw it. Um, and I, I remember a very clear moment when I was starting to talk more in that way before psychology way. And then I remember I was running an NLP course. There used to be eight day courses over three modules. I remember I was on sort of day two or three and I just, we were a group and I just stopped and I said, guys, I've got to tell you something else. Right. So I've been telling them all about, you know, how to manipulate psychology and not manipulate, but change psychology and change neural pathways. I said, I want to tell you about something else. And then I just went off on one for about two or three hours. And after that, they went, wow, that's different. <laughs> and I went, okay, I I'm ready now because my, my mouth can't say the other stuff anymore. Yeah. You, you find yourself just saying it different. You don't really mean to. It wasn't like I'd planned to do that. So I realized that I'd had a realization and now I saw it differently. And then w once you, it's almost like, a valve you kind of see it i mean in spiritual language you you call it slightly waking up there's yeah, that yeah. awakening i mean that that phrase can be very woo. yeah 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 it's as ordinary as you like but that's sort of what happened to me and once you've done that it's it's kind of hard to do the old stuff again because i just saw it and i was like why did i not see that before so the, the question i'm often asking myself is how did I not see that before? I mean, that, I must have asked myself that question a thousand times. <laughs> How did I not see that? Because once you see it, I think it goes from um, invisible to subtle to obvious. Invis and then all different aspects are going from invisible to subtle to obvious. Yeah. And look, I, I don't know where I'm in my investigation at the moment, <laughs> right? Like in, in, uh, in, or where I even stand in terms of, you know, thinking of life one way, like, because I think my initial investigation was through psychology, right? Just mm. in my own lines of self-inquiry, we'll say. Then what I do find, though, is through lots of these different investigations, even then, like from a meditation point of view and almost seeking uh, deeper states of consciousness or, you know, even, you know, like in a very egoic way at the start, thinking, when could I be enlightened or something? You know, if I start meditating uh, every day and, and these kind of things. There's something about all of this that I I think it's far more intriguing because I, I think you get caught in kind of bands of, you know, there's improvements, but there's contractions. There's improvements, contractions in, in some of these investigations. Like it doesn't liberate me, shall we say. There's something really interesting about, I don't know, there's something interesting about the idea of returning to my natural self. And I feel like a lot of the ways in which I've been pursuing life have been adding extra things on to come to a place of, I don't know, not perfection or, imp or improvement or something. And, and I, there's something about this whole investigation for me that just makes me feel like I've been missing the mark in either the way I'm framing this or that it doesn't, it doesn't take me, it doesn't yeah. end up in a place where that I don't end up kind of just doing the same loops as such. I, and I think, I, I totally can relate to what you've just said. And I think many, many people can. And I think I'm now a little clearer on the answer to that than I was. I don't know. It's just my current. I might. I might yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Back and go, what do you want about Piers? But I think a lot of our personal de development was done on behalf of a self looking to make a better version of that self. So it would, it would see things. It would find things in the world that helped there would be that contraction, as you say, sometimes, but it was the investigation or the seeking was done on the, on behalf of this self trying to get better at stuff or more peaceful or more balanced or whatever. I mean, it was, you know, you, you could argue, you know, very genuine intentions. Yeah. Now I think the super important bit to see in that is whenever you're doing it on behalf of that self, it is going to be missing the key ultimate realization or you could call it hack if you want to put it in modern language right which is to see that the very thing that's seeking is in the way of you seeing what is the absolute extraordinary ordinariness of what we are so through the process of what i would now see as direct in, direct experience self-inquiry you start to see that what we're looking for is way before any of the seeking of the mind that's trying to find it right it's metaphor time it's clark kent going to the gym right if people knew who clark kent was they saw him down the gym they'd be going 
what are you doing? You don't need to be pushing those weights. <laughs> Do you not realize what's underneath your shirt? You know, <laughs> So we innocently get caught up in that seeking and we fight we stumble across stuff when the mind temporarily stops seeking and we and we we fall back into this kind of peaceful uh flow state then it kind of goes again right so we have to look at something that's much more under our noses than we thought and we have to wake woke wake up to that then the other bit that complicates it right which i think is also you probably you're alluding to but you tell me is there is an act of I call it clearing up our psychology. Once yeah, yeah. we've had that awakening, psychology is still going to be doing its thing, although we might see the role of psychology differently and it can still hoodwink us, right? Now, once we are super clear, which I don't think many, most people are when they're doing the seeking, once we are super clear what the absolute nub of us is, it's easier to clear up the psychology. And it comes back to there only really being, this is how I see it at this moment, one movement and that is in any moment am i heading further into my psychology into my self-identification into duality into my narrative into my meaning or am i coming back up taking it back to see what the self truly is and i mean when i'm saying taking it back it's actually going back further than most people realize most people go back to or me self the observer i'm saying go back before then to see that what we are is the very essence of an activity of consciousness. We are the very space. We're not even, we're the thing before the observers come in. So go back, back. I got a client, they go, oh, you mean back, back? I go, yeah, back, back. Right? <laughs> so so the, the simple movement is, right, are we heading further in any moment? Are we heading further into our psychology and our meaning and our narrative and our duality and ourselves? Or are we coming back up? And that is literally a question you can ask yourself at any moment in any day. You know, there, there's something really fascinating, though, I think, because if if we look at even some of the the end states or end goals that maybe people are pursuing through different uh, modalities, like even if you say God or something like this, and, and I'm not saying something exists or doesn't exist, I'm saying we're comfortable kind of saying, and people could be comfortable saying we all come from God or God is in everything, right? And um, so to some extent, we could all be one with God in in almost like in, a, in an, an enlightened state, maybe through spirituality. And once again, I'm, I'm playing a bit loose with words here, but mm. your ego would dissolve, you, you know, to, to some like loosely framing that, that you you could you could kind of transcend beyond your ego. There seem, and then even in a, in a quantum physics space, like I love the work of David Bohm and kind of looking at, you know, just this one collect, this his paper on hidden variables and something exists below all this. And what we're seeing out here is just almost projections of what's going on in this, this one body of consciousness, the kind of stuff that he does with Krishnamurti as well. Like there's, so what you're saying the words that you're using, although in some ways this can be almost, you know, a bit like the way you say, like in in some of your material, like the space before thought or, you know, the before psychology behind the eye. I know that this, but what you're talking about with words is quite a, it, co it coincide or it, it aligns with a lot of my own separate investigations into what the nature of things are. Mm. Well, I guess I've tried in my own little way to make accessible codify and democratize all of these things that mystics over time have been pointing to right but make it relevant for today's society and particularly even today's business world which is where the phrase quality of mind came from right and, and that, that that's a wrapper that that's not where the the end it's not where the action's at but to try and make it feel really available for people democratize it open source it and to see that anyone can see what maybe people have thought oh well, that's a spiritual thing i need 20 years of meditating on a hilltop to get that no yeah you just need to see it for yourself and to get behind the words so the words the words are very tricky because they're always sending people off into rabbit holes aren't they um but i think and it's so surprising well maybe it's not surprising actually but it's lovely when you talk to people and in their own language they're sort of pointing what you what what you're on about and they're like oh yeah you sort of 
oh yeah that's like, like you've just gone yeah I can see what you're on about you know so but I think that the one thing is to try and simplify it for people there's a lot of complication in the in the seeking world there's a lot of complication and there's people making concessions about things t- teachers you want to call them or guides and not flagging the concession so in order to make it accessible you know they, they dilute it and they don't need to is it, you know if they're, if they're boiling it back to simplicity or they do need to add something in to make it more accessible then flag that yeah um so you know i i would sort of technically you know i would follow the direct path or the pathless path because I, not because i'm trying to be profounder than anyone else but just because i think that makes it actually simpler but people need to get over the self's mind desire to complicate that yeah, com- completely and even the self's clinging like because yeah. you know when I'm, i mentioned even the idea of like uh in a spiritual sense of enlightenment it's almost like we're okay. We're already we're okay with dissolving into <laughs> into one once we have become enlightened. Once I have become enlightened, and you know, this is I'm I'm even saying this through my own kind of perception of it. You know, like there's almost like this one point where we're okay to let go of the self once the self has proved its specialness. You, you know, and even when I think of how I can kind of catch myself, um, because I've read a number of years ago, I read, uh, is it Douglas Harding's book on having no head? Um, yes. And, and I'm not saying all of this stuff is, uh, is what, um, what, is what aligns perfectly with what you're saying, but there's certain things where I think so often I, I see this and I've had experiences even recently where I'm like, oh my, like really, I think kind of experiences of seeing something in terms of where my my awareness doesn't end uh, awareness doesn't end at the extremities of my being and and kind of noticing noticing something which i hadn't seen so fully in the face before and still trying to almost adjust my language in the la- not trying to adjust my language but not a bit like what you were talking about with the nlp course i'm mm. not as comfortable in the language that i've been using over the last month or so <laughs> yeah well i i think there's I use the phrase, we're always halfway up an infinite invisible ladder on this, right? Now the self would go, let me get to the top, right? (laughs) Well, no, it's infinite. You can't get to the top. So, and it's sometimes like, there's something I feel like, you know, the way I would say it's like, there's like, there's like a realization percolating, you know, there's something you're seeing and and your words haven't caught up yet. So when you express it to someone else, you're like, no, that's not quite it. So the word, then the words will catch up. And that's what Mm. I mean by the invisible to subtle to obvious once it's obvious you can usually talk about it when it's in that kind of subtle phase you're like ah it's sort of this it's sort of that and then the words get very difficult um so i think to 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 boil it back you know for people to to experience this so it doesn't go all kind of like vague and whatever it's to sort of see that the human being is is you know i i talk about one of our biggest superpowers is the capacity for realization, right? And that is for us to see something new about either the world itself or about, or even more important, you know, the world we live in, but also more importantly about what we are, you know? And if we know that capacity for realization is there, we know that there's a sort of inbuilt direction to, I'm gonna say the word evolve without judgment, you know, evolve into this understanding, awaken if you wanna use the spiritual language. And that is a natural attribute of the system. If, and this does seem to be the if for me, if we kind of get out of the way of it and point ourselves into this direction of inquiry, and the way I think we, we naturally can do that is just by removing a lot of the distraction that we do with our minds. So, uh, you know, I, I think we're addicts. We're, we're addicts in, in, in today's society. And I don't just mean to our phones or to alcohol or whatever, we're addicted to thinking about the self, about us. We're addicted to thinking full stop. So we use the faculty of thought in the wrong way. Um, We avoid actually seeing what we are before that by getting very fascinated by the content of our psychologies and and thinking and, oh, we know what, you know, rather than looking at the bit before, 
Now, the bit before, it looks like there's nothing there. You're like, well, why would I look there? There's nothing there. It's boring. It's just, oh, yeah, I, I tried to do that inquiry thing. It's just boring. Nothing happened. I was like, well, that's kind of the point. But you're, you're looking, asking the wrong questions. <laughs> there isn't going to be anything there to see. There's no Netflix playing there, right? But there's something more important than that. There's, and it doesn't take long for people to, to see it through direct inquiry. Maybe a few goes, uh, but it's unconventional. And then you start to see there's a whole essence of what we are before our psychology and and it doesn't take long for us to realize that there's value there now then as we're inquiring into that the noisy self mind that's been having years of being the boss or perceiving to be the boss and getting fascinated by its content comes in and messes that up right so actually it's far simpler than we think it's far far simpler than we think to, to have this awakening thing. It's not some kind of spiritual journey you've got to go on. It's not esoteric. You don't need to do anything fancy. And, and I've got other podcasts that do this, you know, um, is you just need to look at what we are, what's going on in direct experience in any moment and see and start to then see the significance of that, right? And then watch for when the self mind comes in and tries to <laughs> hijack that and make it all about itself and all that kind of stuff. So I think it's actually far simpler than I've made out for 20 years. And I think it's available to anyone. People just have to get over the hump of, well, why would I look there? It looks like there's nothing there. It'd be like looking into the sky, not seeing the sky stars and then pointing the telescope up there. They go, well, let's point at the telescope where the stars are. And you're going, no, there's actually something to see that you can't see yet, but it will emerge. No, I want to point to where all the action is. Don't point to where. The, so do, do you see what I mean? We, we, we kind yeah, of yeah. try and fix our psychology from inside our psychology. And we're saying, no, there's another bit to see. But you have to tread there differently. The way you navigate that is differently to when you're navigating within your psychology. And when you mentioned earlier this idea of um, you tried... Uh counseling for a period of time and then you set, felt it was i think did you say if correct me if I'm wrong you said it's too much in the past or or something to do with that can you kind of elaborate even on that sense of real the realization you made there yeah i, I think I, you know if I, I look at it back now I, I studied it for a bit and i thought even back then in my unenlightened self or maybe i was enlightened we all are i suppose and, <laughs> uh, i was like how is this helpful it's interesting to dig around in your past it's not useful. I, I just didn't think it did much, right? I mean, it's, it's nice to talk about it. Like you might talk about, oh, I read a good book recently. This happened and the character did this. Great. But did it, it didn't, for me, it didn't really make me feel better. It didn't do anything apart from, oh, okay, I've got a different, a slight change in my narrative. And it looked very indulgent too. And I, I you know, I say that, what I mean by that is I intuited that it just felt like it was going the wrong way. And then when I came across, I, I saw the NLP and the positive psychology and all that kind of stuff. I went, oh, at least this is about the future, right? And it's all about, you know, creating the future you want. And it felt more empowering. It felt more uplifting. So even back then in my sort of younger days, I didn't quite know what it was that I didn't like about, not didn't like about cancer, but I didn't see the value. And now again, you know, I, I look back on what I was doing with the the, the, the psychology in, in NLP and all that kind of stuff, I can see how it worked and it did help. And, you know, I got clients, I got big shifts, but it, it, it wasn't as transformative as I thought it was because I didn't know this existed. Yeah. So, and you know, you know. just a question that's coming up for me then is uh, what, like, what is, you know, cause if you're saying just like, okay, the, the going back into the past, it didn't seem like it, it created much of a transformation. The NLP, I can understand what you're saying, just even in terms of program, uh, like programming and and people approaching things in different situations or in different from different perspectives. But then this, what do you kind of see? And this is a very wide wide question, so go wherever you want with it. Yeah. What do you then almost see as the function of like words or inquiries, if you get me? Because you know, because it. it and st and almost even stories to an extent, you know? Yeah, well, I think they're where the beauty of the human experience turns up. Right. Right? So it's where the joy of expressing 
the one consciousness that we all are comes into form. So I'm certainly not someone who goes, oh, no, 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 you don't want to have any human experience or think or have perceptions. No, no, no. No, that's where the value is. But it's about knowing what it is and what it isn't. So it's you can really enjoy a horror movie or a, or a Netflix if you understand the nature of TV. Well, why do little kiddies get totally petrified by watching scary things? It's because they don't know what it's made of. Right. So to me, I see what turns up in the world in words and narratives and things. I, I, my, my, my sort of shortcut is they're real but never true. I mean that at the most profound level. Um, and once you know that, gosh, you can enjoy them for their highs and lows. And I'm doing sort of quotation marks for people on the podcast, you know, because the highs and lows will only look like that compared to our narrative, right? But that's the point of being alive is to be the expression of consciousness that comes into form. And when you do that, as this might sound a bit trite or a bit esoteric. When you do that as consciousness, when you do that knowing you are just nature doing its thing as opposed to a separate self that's seeking or striving or trying to protect itself in the world, it's very different. So the same activity can come from almost two places. It can either come from the self seeking and protecting or it can come as just a, an expression of consciousness into the world with beauty, love and care or compassion. So the same thing, so running yeah, a business, yeah. doing sport, being in a relationship can almost come from two, one or two places. Now that's slightly generalized and kind of boxed in, but if, does that make any sense? No, 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 I, absolutely. Um, and then the thing I'm just intrigued about from your perspective then is like, how, how do you kind of experience the, the highs and the lows? Like, so for example, I, I have a, from my own experience and my own practices and different things, I think when I can hold as much as possible in awareness, I don't take things as personally because there's so many things simultaneously going on, even just in, in terms of my emotion, even the, the, the weather of my emotions, the, the activity in my mind. And um, the more I hold it in awareness, the, the less personal these points are, the less, the less I'm, I'm fixated on one point. So it's not as acute, even as in terms of a high or a low, but it's, it's held there. You're still a human being, right? Who, who is experiencing the range of emotions. So it's almost like, how would you describe it? Like, are you still feeling the quality or the impact or the quality of the emotion, but not the impact of it? Or I know these are things are hard to explain in words, yes. but how would you kind of even point I, to I that? would. I would agree with that. I think I feel more now than I ever did. Yeah. So I got quite good at managing my emotions. Or I, I thought I did. I mean, you can't really do that. There's no free will of the self, but it looked like I could. And, and in NLP, we used to do negativity fasts, right? Avoid the negative, go to the positive, right? But that was shackling, that that was trying to put an artificial high and low on. But now I will allow myself or just surrender to feeling. So I get yeah. more human experience now. But to, to your point, the impact, I don't suffer from that so much. So I'll get narky with my kids. They're usually my kryptonite when they wind me up, right? So I'll get narky with them and then it's done. So I'm more like a two-year-old. You know, two-year-olds yeah. have a big tantrum, blah, and then they just, oh, cool, hello, <laughs> right? Done in like one minute. I'm more like that. So I'll, I'll still experience the world, probably more than I did. I'm, I'm less stoic than I used to be. And when I went to boarding school from quite a young age, you, you didn't want to show too much emotion. You get bullied. So um, I was quite stoic. So now I'm much, ha much more free to be the sky and have any of the weather. And that's quite joyful. And, and again, I put a bit of language around this. In, in my, my world, you, you can sort of have high quality of mind, anger, sadness, upset, and low quality of mind, anger, sadness, upset, right? One's coming from the self thinking it's an entity this is happening to, and one's just coming through consciousness. Yeah. So, and, and how, I'll come back to the thing I said, you know, to, 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 to help yourself with that, you know, you just check in. Am I heading into my psychology when I'm feeling these, you know, the, the, the weather getting stormy? <laughs> am I heading into my psychology or am I coming back up? 
Now, when I'm coming back up to seeing what I am at my essence, I'm still going to experience, have the appearance of sensation and perceptions and stuff. But I don't, you know, I'm like the sky not caring what the weather is. It's like, yeah, it's happening. It's okay. But I'm not taking it personally, as you said. Yeah. I can just see it. And then it comes in without the impact, but you're still experiencing it. So actually, then you realize any emotional feeling is quite beautiful. It doesn't always look that. Like, you know, you're still a human being. Sometimes you're going to get caught out. But much more of the time, you're like, okay, I'm really, really upset. And, you know, that's okay too. You know, what you said there, just even with your your children, like that resonates 100% with the relationship I have with my wife in that I feel like we can fight. We can fight even frequently. Like, we, you know, we get on beautifully as well, obviously. But I mean that but it's done like i i don't we don't go to bed that night or we don't fight for hours over something it's momentary it erupt it arises it's it's observed it's addressed and and then it's kind of like wipe your hand not like yeah. not that yeah. clinical all the time but i really i don't know what it is about this when you said it's not personal it's almost like an observing of the the melodrama of the self playing out while the self takes responsibility, like, you know, I'm not going, oh, we'll just yeah, no free will here. Bypassing. No, I hear that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But there is something, I think there's something really important about what you said there. And just in terms of you're still a human being, because I think so many people get caught in how we relate to other people that these things get held onto for no real good reason. Yes. Yes. And I, I, you know, so often, you know, like I'll, I'll get a bit narky with the kids and I might send them a message and say, oh, I'm really sorry. Your dad didn't mean to do that. Daddy didn't mean to do that. And they go, I know, we know it's cool. Like what are you apologizing for? It's of course it's fine. I know you love me. And it's just, you know, I was an idiot too kind of thing. Right. Yeah. So it's done. Right. It's absolutely done. It, it, you see it in nature. You'll see chimps throwing sticks at each other. Right. It's just <laughs> it's part of what we do. Right. Yeah. Especially when you love someone, you're going to care. Yeah. Right. So it's bound to be like that. And we just need to see that, see that for what it is. It's funny when you say nature there, because when I, when I lived in Peru for a year before coming to Berlin, I'd see dogs fight all the time. And you could see them actually getting into it um, a little bit viciously at times, but then they could still just sit beside each other. <laughs> you know, whereas if, if I was putting a human, um, a human interpretation of that event, I would think they'd have to be separated for, yeah. for a long time. They'd almost have to be mediation in between them, but yet they're just kind of sitting there after and maybe even playing a bit again. Yes. So I, I don't think we want to vilify the self or the psychology or the humanness, yeah. but I think that's a very... That can be quite a confusing thing for people to navigate that if they're doing it without the realization, right? I think once you realize what we're talking to, that makes more sense. You can kind of go, oh, yes, I can see that. Whereas if you try and navigate that on manual mode, that's yeah. tricky because the self's trying to do it to the self and it, it doesn't really work. You, I think you have to, so I think to have a, to put a couple of words on it, to, uh, to have a more, to have more grace, enlightenment in your life i think it really helps to have woken up to what we are first so yes. the way i might summarize my career is before for the first 15 years or so or 10 years i was trying to help people have a more enlightened life without them having the awakening of the, that what they truly are now i do it the other way around and it's much easier to have that grace with the human condition and to deal with our psychology deal with it clear it up dissolve it just be be okay with it once you've had the waking up to what we are. That's a, I'd say that's a very mature observation um, in terms of awareness of how other people could be even interpreting that. Um, the the thing I'd, I'd even say, because that kind of reminds me a little bit of when people talk about radical honesty or radical candor, great if you've if you're a if you're a human that has some kind of peace or tranquility or harmony within themselves, but if you're just firing out things um, and you haven't maybe come to much peace in yourself. Radical honesty or candor could be a pretty, pretty wild experience. Right. And, and, and you'll find this when you work with someone, if you're working with an individual and their, their family or their spouse or their thing hasn't, isn't aware of what's going on. And then they suddenly start behaving slightly differently. And they're like, well, what's go that doesn't make sense to me because, you know, in their separate reality, they don't see it like that. So you've got to be respectful to where people are at. And, and that's okay. Of course it's okay. It's also okay. But you can't then, <laughs> as you say, you, if, if, you're, if you're saying something differently and assuming everyone else is, then you're kind of missing the point. 
Um, but I think also beautifully, I think what one of the things that's really occurred to me in the last couple of years is that, and, and you hinted at it earlier with David Bohm's stuff, and I, I, is he one of the first sort of science guys I got into about this, was what I see now at a practical level is what's turning up for us in the world of form, in our perceptions and thoughts and sensations, and in what we would appear in the world of matter, is only ever a rendering or reflection of what is in our own psychology, if you like. So it's a beautiful gift. I know that word's a bit trite, but it's like an opportunity to see, oh, that's turning up. Right. Rather than then the self go and protect or seek within that, it's like, okay, if I step back from that, I can see that this is showing me where my current psychology's at. Right. I don't need to vilify that, fix that, you know, judge it, but I can kind of go, oh yeah, that's turning up. And you start to see that when I work with clients, that what's turning up in their world is just, is great because it's showing them where they're at. Now they can either go, oh, woe is me and get into the self and try and fix it. Or they can go back, back, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. then come one step forward and go, okay, so what, 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 what is that showing me? Okay, there we go. And that's the evolution. That's the evolution, not to be raced at or try to fix, because that's the beauty of being alive in, in this realm anyway. When you think of, and I know it's not the act of changing then or deciding I am going to change, I'm going to fix this now, but there is something really interesting. Like I love something and look, I may be mixing and match, uh, like just sloppily kind of just jumping from one perspective or discipline to another when I say this, but I love the perspective in quantum physics that, you know, when something could be observed, it could be, it could be a particle when it's not observed, it could be a wave. Yeah. And there, there's just something to that where I think in all the, the rush to fix ourselves in air quotes, um, that it, it is just this continuous just observe like observing of things and, and things just because things are always changing right like and it's almost like as you say it's that the getting out of the way of the change that will be occurring like there's something i don't know there's something really beautiful about this that it's it's not being not being like really passive because the self will still be an active participant in this 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 world that we're we're experiencing but there's something about like it just, I don't know, there's something about not inhibiting its natural path. There's something to that right. effect. And I think, you know, the way I sometimes try and summarize that, I, you know, and, and this is in, informed by a guy called Rupert Spara talks about this beautifully, but I, I, I really see it. And, and the way I'd say it is any suffering we have and i mean mild or major so not just like severe mental health but any kind of like stress or anxiety or, or or lack of joy if you want to call it that yeah any suffering mild or major comes from resistance to the what is hmm. right the what is is just raw perception raw sensation just what is happening and appearing in the space we call the mind or consciousness so any suffering mild or major comes from resistance to the what is any resistance comes from an innocent, invisible self-identification with us as an entity, as a self. Yeah. Right. If we can see through that, most things sort themselves out. And that, what you're talking about, that perpetual dynamic fluidness to the what is, because it is, I mean, there's, there's nature's doing its thing. Where were you going to call it? I mean, there are thousands of processes that science has spotted that's going on and millions that science doesn't know that's going on that is forming the what is. We haven't got a hope of knowing what that is. We've only got this little perceptual hardware that we are in human form. We've got no hope. I mean, that's why science says, oh, 99% of the universe is dark matter. We don't really understand it. Yeah, okay, so let's just be peaceful with that, going, we don't know. But stuff turns up right? And it will, the, the what is, is what turns up through the human perceptual system. And any suffering comes from resistance to that. And any resistance comes from self-identification. Now, people might hear that and go, what, you mean I've just got to be a doormat? And if something bad happens to me, then I'm just a victim to that. No, 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 no. That's resistance already. right? <laughs> because once you see what you are, it doesn't really matter what the what is is because that's part of life and even better 
there's a resourcefulness to deal with that, to, 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 to make something of that, to have a beautiful experience from that, to create from that, to connect from that. That's the point. It's only the resistance to that that causes our suffering. And in the absence of suffering, we are peace and happiness. Yeah, I, I think that's um, that's beautifully put. This sense of if you don't resist the pr like the present situation, you will naturally respond. It will work itself out naturally if you just don't get in the way of it. Like, yes, and in that, you just got to watch out when the self thinks. But it needs to work itself out in option A, not option yeah, B, yeah, yeah. right? Because that's the self resisting again. Going, I want it to work itself out, so I win the lottery. Well, okay, well, that's not necessarily going to happen, right? <laughs> yeah. So you've got to be open to go, I don't know what the future is going to do, but you have a kind of, this is what the awakening gives you, just a, a knowing that whatever happens is okay. So you're not trying to be controlling the future. That's, again, a form of resistance. I had a I had an experience before I was delivering some uh, corporate work based from this What is a Good Life project for the first time. And I remember... Uh, in a little prayer to whoever that I said, I said, if this is going to be the, if this is going to be meant for me, let me feel that I'm, I'm born for it, if you know what I mean. And if it's going to be the worst, the, the most shocking, uh, deliverable thing ever, uh, just let me handle it with grace. And, and I, I kind of, I've, I, I think that's like what you're saying there and just even how I'm thinking about life, because just what you said there as well. You pointed it out so clearly when you think of all the things that contribute to anything happening at any given moment, our ability to control that is like just, you know, like it, it's, mm. it, it pales and uh, it pales almost in like nothing. Even if you did, let's just say, even if you said, I absolutely have free will. I'm even just talking about from an environmental point of view, everything that's happened before us, atoms not existing until 300,000 years after the Big Bang. All of these things coming to this very moment, even if I had absolute control and volition over my own actions, thoughts, emotions, I would still have very little control over what's happening. Um, let alone, let alone with uh, I don't know my perspectives or questions or inquiries around free will. So I do think it is this beautiful idea of whatever is, can I accept it, and from there something else will emerge. And I think in, in that question, the really key part of that question, can I accept it, is going, what's the I? But that's the really, so you know, in a simplified way, I sometimes think, well, what, what is my work? How do I differentiate my work? Well, my work, when, when a manager says, oh, how can I get most out of my team? I'm not going to, I used to start at the, oh, what, what does most mean? And what does this look like? I now start yeah, yeah. at the I. I go, which, which eye is that? And they're like, what do you mean, which eye? There's only one eye. I go, no, nah, okay. Do you want to know what more about that? So can I accept that? Again, the eye we're talking about, if we think it's the self, the separate body mind that's Mark or Piers, right? Then we're already in, in resistance. We're already in separation. If we go, can I consciousness accept that? Well, of course you are, because you are consciousness. How can you not? It is part of you, right? Yeah. That's like saying the sky going, Oh, can I accept this weather storm? No, I don't think so. You know, that rain almost got me last time. I don't want any more of that snow stuff. <laughs> or the TV going, no, don't put Channel 5 on again. It does my pixels, right? Um, <laughs> so we've got to just look at that eye. That's yeah. the crux. Yeah, yeah. And when we see that, the answer to your question is, yeah, it may be bumpy, but of course it can't damage what I truly am. So what turns up? In, on the screen of perceptual, sensational thought can't damage what I truly am, like the weather can't damage the sky. And if we know that, the resistance to the what is drops away because the what is can't do anything. The reason we have a problem with the what is is we think it can do us in. We think it can be less good or bad. It think, we think it can damage us. No, it can't. Only the self could think that, not what we truly are. When you, when you approach life from this perspective or when you are when the awareness is this of life it's it's not like that you're suddenly you know it's not like it doesn't you're not playing any kind of psychological tricks with yourself you're not like even doing what i kind of sometimes see as a bit of a spiritual hoodwink you know when i let go of materialism i'll get uh, yeah. i'll get abundance yeah. you know what i mean like you you're you're not promising anything to yourself from this 
it's just awareness is and it's on unfo- it's it's happening it is or like there's it seems like from this from that place it you're not even going to say that your life is going to be 10x whatever it's going to be better or it it's it's just going to occur yeah i think you know absolutely so it's not like i'm doing it waiting for ooh this is going to happen um i just find it so much easier to find peace and enjoyment it just seems to be in each moment more i mean i can you know i don't have to do anything spectacular i don't have to climb mount everest to go oh yeah i'm successful or to get or i don't have to meditate for 10 hours to get peaceful i can just be so you feel you, you feel your essential nature is peace joy and fulfillment connection that's very mm. available it doesn't come from activity and then what happens in the world of form in my business in my relationships in my parenting whatever I'm less bothered by what happens. I can have an intention and I can create in the world, but I'm totally neutral as to whether that happens or not. Whereas before I'd like, if this happens, if this happens, then yeah. So I'm like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to create something, you know, a beautiful relationship or, or great parenting or, or a business outcome, but I'm not, I'm coming at that with a neutral. So there's a positive intention, but it's totally neutral at the same time, which sounds like a contradiction is not because I, I'm I'm sailing more than rowing, to use the yeah. metaphor, right? And gosh, rowing's hard work, but it's what a lot of us does. It's what the rat race is about. And sailing's like, well, okay, the wind's blowing me. Okay, we're going here. We're going here. Fine. Do I want to tack and try and go the other way? No. Let's see where it goes. Sometimes you can get disappointed. The wind's not strong enough. Well, that's just the self going. I should be getting there quicker. But when you step back and you see what you know, you were t- talking earlier about, you know. The physics of it all, quantum entanglement, conscious entanglement, you start to see, wow, how things manifest in the world is not linear. There's synchronicity and serendipity. Time's even an illusion. So a conversation we're having now could affect a conversation I had a week ago. What? How does that work? Well, I don't know how that works, and I'm not going to try. Whereas, with, you know, so just to know that the universe has got your back, but but not because I need it to sort me out and win the lottery, right? Not because of that, because I know I'm always going to be okay, but being open to what, so I think we just have to open up and, and particularly in the business world and, and the, the Western world, we just have to open up and go, I don't know, but there's something magical that can happen. Not that I want that, you know, not, I'm not going to be optimistic. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on, magical. Where's my magical? You said magical. Magical hasn't turned up yet. No, because if you do that, it's a self-seeking. Right. But when you almost turn that off, wow, cool things happen. Just serendipity. Boom. How did that happen? Don't know. That's beautiful. I think the essence of what you capture there is really there. There is something really. I don't know. There is such I, I do believe there is such peace that comes like whether whatever stage we're we're in, in even in in this inquiry or whatever it is, there's always moments, I think, of contact um, with this. I think there's moments of contact with this state where we get insights into whether it was through intentional inquiry or, or not. I think there's moments in life where we come into contact with this this quality. And in those moments when you observe, well, what 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 was a precursor to that? Often there's no rhyme or reason to it. And, and that I and, think and is I, going, you, you're right. That is going back to the sim, this stuff incredibly simple, but not easy. Why is it not easy? Because we complicate it. So what you're just talking about, that space is available for any human being in any moment, but we yeah. overlook it. Yeah. Go back, back. It's there. Now, it doesn't manifest into the Ferrari or, or whatever you want it to be, right? No, 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 no. It's not what we're talking about. But the space of creation, because we're all, it's always, as you said, it's always, a, there's no staticness to the consciousness, right? So, but we need to go back, back to see that space that allows that to have more fluidity, I think. Right. It goes back to what I said. All suffering, mild or major, comes from resistance. All resistance comes from self-identification, right? We take it back. We get in that space of creating in, in a more pure form. Look, Pierce, um, just conscious of, of the time here and, and you know, 
usually I kind of recap what people have said throughout the course of this. I'm intrigued to what you're going to say to the question of what is a good life. I know you've even just you've mentioned things like peace and joy and, you know, even relationships and things like that, but not even in a not even an attached outcome to things. So without me kind of recapping all that's been said, I'd just be more intrigued in whatever way it comes up for you. What is a good life for you, sir? I think what is a good life? It's seeing the nature of what we are at our essential self, seeing that we are at our essence, peace, joy, happiness, and we are everything that you know that the me is a we we are one thing however disparate it might appear we are everything so what a good life is is recognizing what we are at our essential nature before the, the human psychology kicks in and distracts us thinking with something else recognizing that we are all one and that's with nature with animals with fellow human beings and there's no and, and there's a beautiful Benevolent, you want to call it that, intelligence, you want to call it that, design to the system. And if we let that do its thing, there's so much beauty, joy, connection, experience, good and bad, to be available, which won't, without all the suffering that we've accidentally brought along with us. That's a, that's a highly, um, I don't know satisfying answer <laughs> well I mean, I think, you know, I, i've said it a few times i didn't want to repeat myself too much so i just sort of sort of said it in a different way but i would to answer the i mean i think the whole beautiful conversation we've had mark has been answering your great great question so um i would suggest to people uh if they wanted to to listen to it more than once because yeah yeah because you're here you're here behind our words you know our words are just pointers but hopefully if you get curious press pause on what you currently know listen to it a few times, you'll have your own insights. And that's where the power is from your own insight. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Pierce, thank you so much for your time and for joining us on the What is a Good Life podcast today. I've enjoyed this conversation immensely, sir. Me too. Love it. If you want to have another one, Mark, we've got more to talk about, I'm sure. So thank you so much for having me on. Really appreciate it. And um, wonderful projects. I wish you all the best. Thank you. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast and want to know more, check out our website at qualityofmind.biz and also feel free to reach out and leave us a review or a comment. Until next time, have fun being curious. <laughs>